Hello everyone and welcome to our talk on the modern seller's approach to account planning. And we want to show you why this is not the typical way of account planning and capabilities needed there. I'm thrilled to welcome LinkedIn top sales voice Amy Franco for this conversation. In her best-selling book, The Modern Seller, Amy shares the five key capabilities that you need to amplify your sales success. Amy, it's such a pleasure to having you with me today again. Britta, thank you so much. I've been so looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Amy, let's jump right into our topic of today. And yeah. in your book, The Modern Seller, how do you actually define a modern seller and what is or what and why is it so important in today's days? Oh, so um, so what's so interesting is I, I released the book uh, two years ago, uh, last month, October. And what is so what's been so interesting to me is how relevant the the topic is and the themes are in the book even two years later, and I would say probably even going forward two more years. So that's been a really interesting experience just to, to watch all of that uh, unfold and continue for it to, to be really relevant. Um, so if I were to maybe categorize that answer in, in, into two areas, mm -hmm. first I'll give just a working definition for the modern seller, and then I will just highlight the five key capabilities that I'm seeing modern sellers, modern sales leaders mm -hmm. really having to embrace and build in themselves. Um, so, so first a working definition. I see someone, basically three things that I see a modern seller or sales leader do really well. And, and the first is that they are seen by their clients. And I would also say by their prospective clients mm -hmm. as someone who is a differentiator to them. They, they are recognized as a difference maker. Um, the second thing I would, would define as a modern seller is the value of their product, their service, their solution, whatever it is you sell, the value of it is not as valuable without you as part of the equation, you as, as the seller or the sales leader. And, and then lastly, I think of a modern seller as someone who is seen as they're, they're so valuable to their clients that their clients can't imagine not doing business without them. They are really ingrained and in, in just a part of their success, um, which is the, it's a pretty high bar um, mm -hmm. to think about what it means to be a modern seller today because our, our, our buyers, our, our decision makers, they have so much more on their plates they have uh, so many more expectations of us that we really have to make this transition from potentially being more transactional to the, this modern seller, which is much more strategic, much more value-based. Um, so so that, that's a working definition of the modern seller. And maybe I'll stop there and see if there's anything you want to follow up with on that before mm -hmm. I get into the five capabilities. Yes, exactly. I mean, one thing that just sparked my mind when you described the modern seller, I always had this picture of the trusted advisor in my head. Yeah. So is, is that comparable from your point of view or is it totally different? How would you distinguish those two terms? I would say it's very comparable. And, uh, you know, tr trusted advisor is a term that's used a lot. And, then, you know, there's other phrases to describe it. And, and it can be something that's a, maybe a bit uh, overused. Mm -hmm. um, but I would encourage anyone in a client facing sales role or you're leading a team, what does a trusted advisor and a modern seller mean to you? I, I see those as being very, very much connected, mm -hmm. but what does that mean to you? And can you give yourself those definitions for yourself and for your team so that you always have it in your minds and you're always working toward it? But I think they're very comparable. Great. Cool. So let's walk us through the five key capabilities, Amy. Do you yeah, mind sharing sure. that? Absolutely. So, so in my work, as, as I was putting together this book and researching and working with my clients, I saw five capabilities that uh, if seller sales leaders build in themselves and their teams, it's going to make them better at their everyday selling activities. Mm -hmm. So I, I wish I could tell you your everyday selling activities will go away, but uh, not the case. <laughs> These will make you better at it. Um, so a modern seller is agile, uh, entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. holistic, mm -hmm. social, and an ambassador. And uh, would you like me to just give you a working definition for each of those? And then we could see which ones you'd like to dive into further. Um, yes, but maybe first, 
maybe you can share which of those five is from your point of view the most important or your most favorite one with i mean everyone has a ah uh, yeah to one especially so is there anything yeah you know that's a great question i probably for purposes of this conversation where we're talking about account planning mm -hmm. I would say entrepreneurial mm -hmm. is a, a great set of capabilities to dig into um, because we do have to think differently about ourselves, about our clients, about account planning. So I would say entrepreneurial for this conversation. Great. So maybe you can give us a brief definition of the four others and sure. then we do a little more deep dive into the entrepreneurial. All right, it's a game plan. So, uh, so a modern seller is agile. Uh, agility is really being able to, uh, you are nimble, you are able to see, see ahead of the curve and anticipate change. Uh, we are living in a world of change and disruption right now. So we need to be able to uh, think quickly, make take decisive action. We need to be able to pivot as needed. We need to be able to help our clients and prospects do the same thing. So that's agility. Mm -hmm. um, holistic is, uh, it, it's twofold. I would say for purposes of this conversation, I think of holistic as thinking about everything being connected. So your, your pipeline is interconnected, your relationships are interconnected. Um, everything in your sales process is connected mm -hmm. before the sale occurs, after the sale occurs. So thinking holistically means I'm not just thinking about my little piece of the pie. I am thinking about the big picture for our clients or, or for your organization too. So is so that holistic. also thinking collaborative, collaborative and uh, communicative? Yes. yes. Absolutely. So, so collaboration is a big part of it because when we aren't just looking, living in our own silo mm -hmm. and we have to be thinking bigger picture, that requires a lot of collaboration to be able to do that successfully. Yep, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so the last two, a modern seller is social. Mm -hmm. uh, social is really about strategic relationships. Um, you will never see relationships on, uh, you know, a, a PL of an organization, but Individuals and organizations that really get the value of strategic relationships, they understand that relationships and people are what really help to create success. Sales success, personal success, organizational mm -hmm. success. So really being intentional about the relationships that we're building. So, so that's the social aspect mm -hmm. of modern selling. And then the last one is being an ambassador. Um, we spend so much time earning new client business. I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of time on that. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and if we flipped the equation just a little bit to um, not only pay attention to the new business that we're bringing in, but to put more time and resources toward growing the clients that we have, mm -hmm. being an ambassador is building about building loyalty truly in the end. More, the more loyal a client is, the more open they are to our ideas, the more we have the ability to uh, grow that relationship. A loyal client is three times more likely to mm -hmm. continue buying from us. So, so being an ambassador is about balancing new business with client growth and really looking at the, at the long-term value of the relationship. Mm -hmm. Great. So the ambassador could also be something customer success members should really yes. have in their DNA. I'm the ambassador of our brand, of our products, and that's what I'm going for. Yes, absolutely. And, and you touched on something that, that I'll, I'll briefly cover, which is someone who really embraces this idea of being an ambassador. They really espouse the, the brands of their organization. And they also have their own unique brand out in the marketplace. They, they are truly seen as someone who uh, sort of is, it rises above by mm -hmm. blending their brand with their organization's brand. Wonderful. That sounds great. All right. So I think we have our key capability left, the entrepreneurial. Yes, entrepreneurial. And this, this ties so nicely into our conversation about account planning. So, so someone who is entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. they, are, they don't just see themselves as an employee of their organization. They really see themselves as, as someone who has an ownership stake. Mm -hmm. they, and, and when you think about yourself in that way, 
you make different decisions. You are looking at the top line of maybe your sales territory. You're looking at the top line. You're looking at the bottom line. You are looking and evaluating your best opportunities and in, in your risks. Those are different decisions than simply just looking at what's, what's right in front of you. And as a sales leader, if you have a team of very entrepreneurial, modern sellers, you're having very different conversations. And, and I would say you're also having very different account planning conversations because you're, you are just looking at everything differently and making your decisions differently. Great, super. So now we heard the five capabilities, Amy. And just because we have those capabilities doesn't mean that I'm creating a perfect account plan. Sure. So from your point of view, what are the key aspects those modern sellers should always keep in mind when they are creating an account plan? What are the must-haves? Yeah, so, so this ties very well into being a modern seller because you're thinking strategically mm -hmm. about your sales territory. You're, you're thinking strategically about your clients. And, and in my own work, and then in bringing this type of work to my clients, I've found that there are, there are six or seven categories that, that really help to, to focus on. And so um, I'm actually going to read them from my list so I don't forget them. <laughs> the first one, um, goals and milestones. You need, you need to have a sense of where you want to be in the next year. And most of my clients are looking out about a year, maybe a little bit longer, mm -hmm. but you have to know where you want to be going and what are the milestones that will help you get there. Um, then secondly, uh, these kind of blend together. You want to have your key verticals that mm -hmm. you are spending your time with, and then the ideal clients within those verticals. Do you have them named? Do you know who they are? So, so those two things, those two mm -hmm. go together. Um, then you have your relationship personas. And that this has a lot of, a lot of labels to it. It could be a decision maker persona. I like to think of them as key relationship personas for, mm -hmm. for my verticals. Uh, and then there are two more, your strategic alliances. What are those other relationships that you're building outside of your organization? And then your brand presence is, is the last one. So I find that if you, you hone in on those and you don't have to build them out all at once, but if you hone in on those, you're going to have a really strong plan to help you go forward. And it's a, it's a living plan. It's not something that you create and then, then set aside. Yeah. So you mentioned now, if I can just recap them for our audience, so sure. they also hear them again, it's goals and milestones, mm -hmm. the vertical targets and the target clients, the key relationship personas. Can we actually also call them like a stakeholder map if we speak about personas? Sure, sure. And, and people might have different different phraseology for it. But those those two things, um, it, it sounds like it's, there's definitely some similarities there. Yeah. Then the strategic alliances and the brand presence. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So Amy, from your experience, if we would choose one that sh should definitely be done and can never ever be left out, which one would you pick? Oh, which one do we never uh, do we never leave out? Um, boy, okay. I'm going. I, I think goals and milestones. That that's always in there. I, I feel like feel like that's a given. So I that I'm going to set that one aside because I think that's always always needs to be there. Um, I would say your key verticals are very important. Um, not only if you are a mature business or you have a mature territory, but especially, you know, thinking entrepreneurially, especially if you have um, some white space territory or you are building, you know, you are going after more competitive clients, having those verticals will really anchor you in a lot of the other parts of the plan. Great. Okay. So Amy, when we look at uh, some strategies, because, you know, a plan is good on paper, but we want to keep it alive and we also want to keep everyone accountable to it. What kind of strategies can you map out for us here to make sure, it? Sure, sure. So, so I, like, I like to think of it as keeping your plan from collecting digital dust. I don't know about you, but I've, cre I've created many a plan where <laughs> I was so excited about it and <laughs> very inspired by it. And then, you know, a quarter or two later, I'm like, oh, where was that plan? right? And it's in, it's in the back of my computer somewhere. Um, so if that has happened to anybody that's watching this, uh, you are not alone. 
so, so really thinking about how do you keep something alive and accountable, I would say first and foremost is the, is the mindset and the decision to, to say that I, I'm going, I, I am committed to keeping this alive and I am committed to being accountable to it. So that, that's, that's the first part is just the decision piece of it. And then secondly, uh, I think there's a couple things that, that you can do. Um, first is if you are an individual, do you have um, some kind of accountability partner? I've always been, anytime I've wanted to really move forward with something, having that peer accountability partner mm -hmm. has helped me exponentially versus trying to do it on my own. Um, and another way to look at that is if you are a, you're a sales leader, you have a team, can you, uh, can you help to be that accountability partner uh, for, for your team? So, so I would say th those are a couple of strategies that, that I've found to be helpful. Great. Do you also have idea ideas on how to make account planning sessions fun that the AEs actually want to do them? Because usually it's like, Where's your plan? How do your next steps look like? All those things. And you're like, oh, damn, I have to do that again. But right. are there fun parts which you could recommend to do that? Yeah, I see the, the typical account plan is that that 50, that 50 slide uh, deck that you have to put together, <laughs> not only for your territory, but then having to do it for, say, your, your top 10 accounts or, or whatever that looks like. Um, I would say, first and foremost, I, I find that simplicity helps. Mm -hmm. um, when you are staring down a 50 page PowerPoint deck and having to fill that in, it, it's not very inspiring. <laughs> At least for me, it's not. So, so I would say the simpler that you can keep it, the better, mm -hmm. because our brain can only do so many things at once and can only hold on to so much information. When we're trying to do too much in a plan, that's where it starts to just gather dust because it's not useful anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for myself, something that I'm doing, and, and this may, this is, may not fit everyone's situation, but I'm actually taking some time uh, next week. I'm taking, taking two days out where I'm going to get out of my office and I am going to go somewhere else, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> healthy and socially distanced, of course. Uh, <laughs> but I'm actually going to take some time away. And I, I have some themes that I'm going to work on in my account plan. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's something that motivates me and inspires me because my, my calendar is cleared and emptied and then I can, can focus on it. Um, that may not fit everybody's situation. So if that doesn't fit your situation, um, I would say if you can do an account plan in smaller pieces, mm -hmm. that can help. Rather than trying to tackle everything at once, doing it in smaller chunks as a team in Zoom or whatever can, can definitely help move it along. So a few, just a few ideas there to think about. I like the last one because it again comes back to keeping it simple and taking out complexity. Because if you think you have to tackle this whole big thing, you're overwhelmed. And put it into small pieces, simple again. I think that's a great idea of putting it together. Yeah. And, and the, the other piece of that is when, when, the, when an account plan is so full of strategies or tactics, mm -hmm. you know, whatever someone's account plan looks like, when it is too full, the, the confused mind makes no choice. So it's keeping it simple enough and keeping it very focused. Yeah. What are the two or three things that I'm going to do with my plan to move forward faster, to, to go further versus the 50 things that are maybe in my plan. And I'm not going to get to any of them. I might get to one. So yeah. just that simplicity just keeps us focused. Yeah, great. So it's keep it simple, digestible and focused. That's, yes. I think, three things we can take away from this part now. You summarized that beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, so from everything we heard so far, and we want to begin with the implementation, how would you recommend on doing that? I mean, we touched upon some things already, but is there anything you want to add on that? I think the, the one thing that I would add is I, I'm a big fan of using a templated approach. Mm -hmm. So if they're a simple template, 
I'm a big fan of that. It's um, it gives you somewhere to start. If you if you've ever ta tackled a big project, I don't know about you, but if you've ever tackled a big project and I um, you're looking for that place to start, it's really easy to procrastinate if you don't have that solid place to begin. So I find that using a template that gives you a track to run on and also gives you some flexibility, it ends up being a great place to start because it's it's more motivating to get started. Mm -hmm. Great, Subi. Are you a fan of any kind of technology or a specific methodology for account planning? Did did you come across anything there? You know, I um, I tend I tend to keep things fairly low tech when it comes to account planning, and I realize that that doesn't fit every organization because you might be working globally, you might have large teams. Um, I would say for myself, I I, I keep it keep it fairly low tech. Um, but what I will say is that if you have a, um, if you have a CRM, you have leveraged the technology that you have versus always trying to bring in something new. Um, think about, I like to think about how I can keep it as low tech as possible and accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that, that's, that's my, my thought process around it. Um, but I would be curious on, uh, on what you're seeing out in the marketplace with this too. Well, if we think about what we are seeing is, I mean, we do have our design thinking based account planning, what we really use, we also use it internally and we share it with our partners and our customers and clients. It's um, really something which also matches again, the entrepreneurial skill sets of the modern seller because it's there to co-create with the customer. It's there to validate what you come up with and it actually comes up with an innovative new plan so, which is approved with the customer. So it's not something you are making up in your little room and think that's the right way to go or something like that. So it's actually co-created together and standardized. And what we really uh, are looking forward to is the account growth workflow, which will be launched soon by Membrane. And because there you can easily um, display your key accounts and where you see the biggest potentials there. So that's something we really like to... Um, leverage if technology comes into the game. So we have the template plus leveraging technology to make it visible for the whole company at one point, uh, one plate. So, so you said something that I wanted to just dig into for a moment, which is um, almost, it, it almost sounds like a bit of a, um, a two tiered approach, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, so some of the things that, that I shared are maybe, maybe up, up here. Mm -hmm. And then what you're sharing is also um, something that can be, it's almost like a layer deeper mm -hmm. where you have, let's say your, so almost back to ambassador, you have your top X number of clients and this type of very specific account planning for the growth with that client that you then, I love, love that idea of the client's part of the process. You almost have an agreement at the end of it. And then it gives you something to come back to, whether it's monthly, quarterly, whatever that looks like. Exactly. So That's the key. It's the agreed plan or roadmap with the customer together because you're looking and visualizing in the tool your best accounts. You get also an understanding of them and the whole team can understand them based on the data which is available because as we see a lot of times we have fluctuations or new people coming in. So they do have all the historic data there and uh, it is together with those key accounts or your best customers. That's why I said the ambassador with customer success before where I had this link where it all matched together. And Yes, it's an agreed plan. It's not that you get those surprises out of nowhere that, oh, I was thinking that might be the right idea for this customer. You don't fall into these traps anymore because yes, it's agreed and you reiterate, as you said, quarterly, half yearly or yearly, More, worst case yearly, but you should yeah, have Yeah, yeah. And I, I can really see how... Um your your client is you get that opportunity to build more loyalty you are with them more often you are building deeper knowledge about their business about their challenges you're getting to know them personally so mm -hmm. you're getting to know your decision makers your other stakeholders at a personal level too and, and that makes a huge difference in being able to to to, to keep that to keep them sticky with us if you will and, and to keep working together exactly and also keeping them engaged because yeah. The data is going to show you when did you speak last time to stakeholder A. And if it's 
thinking about account growth, what account planning also should keep in there, you see, hey, I have to speak to three, four, five stakeholders within this account and not just one. So it's building the relationship with the whole customer itself and not just one person there, which yeah, also mitigates the risk of losing them again in the end. Yes, we look, we work so hard to earn that client and we want to do everything we can, especially if they are an ideal client. If they are someone who is really ideal to us and a great fit, we want to be doing everything we can to make sure not only to keep them, but we want to build that really deep, deep, deep relationship with them and grow together, right? Absolutely. Well, great, Amy. Thank you so much for sharing your insights on the modern seller and also how we can tie that together with account planning. I hope everyone is able to take something away from this great conversation with Amy. And thanks again for being with me today, Amy. Britta, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.